Every person's life is marked by periods of great struggle. For some, the struggle is very brief and intense. For others, the struggle is longer, slower, and more drawn out. But all of us can point to times in our lives when we have had to struggle through some kind of adversity. And as Christians, these times, these struggles are so important for us. Because as painful as they can be, they are also the times when we are most likely to have our closest encounters with God. Let us pray. Lord God, as we wrestle with your word to us in Scripture once again today, we pray that you would indeed grab hold of us, so that we may encounter you. We ask this together in Christ's name. Amen. I'm reading today from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. And just to give you kind of a quick historical context for where we're at, um, about, we're a ways through Genesis at this point, and you'll remember the way Genesis goes. There's creation, and then the fall, chapter 3. And there's Noah, and then there's Abraham. God makes a promise to Abraham to make his descendants uh, a huge nation that would be a blessing to the rest of the world. Abraham's son is Isaac. Isaac's son is Jacob, who's the main character in our story today. And this is the story where Jacob is renamed Israel. And his 12 sons become the leaders of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. So this is how the story goes. The same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He said to him, What is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. He said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Anuel, limping because of his hand. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Jacob was a man who was obsessed with getting a blessing out of life. When he was born, he came out grabbing the heel of his slightly older twin brother Esau. And so his parents named him Jacob, which means to strive, or it can also be translated cheater. <laughs> Not very flattering, I suppose, but that's what his parents named him. And from that point on, Jacob spent his entire life trying to cheat or swindle or steal a blessing out of everybody that he could. For Jacob, a blessing was anything that would give him an advantage over other people, a leg up on the competition. The first person from whom Jacob stole a blessing was his older brother Esau. When their father was dying, Jacob went into the tent. His father was expecting to bless his oldest son. But while Esau was out, Jacob went into the tent where his father was. He was dressed in his brother's clothing. He had sheep's wool on his arms so that he would feel like his much hairier older brother. And so he stole the blessing from his brother. His father blessed Jacob instead of Esau. Esau was so angry that Jacob had to run for his life. Esau swore that he would kill his brother. So Jacob runs. And then later on in the story, the next person that, that Jacob would have to run from, the next person he stole a blessing from, was his own father-in-law, Laban. After marrying a couple of his daughters and using some somewhat unorthodox shepherding practices, he basically tricked his father-in-law out of most of his wealth. So he eventually had to run for his life from Laban, too. But once that happened, Jacob didn't have anywhere else that he could go. 
We didn't have, have anywhere else to run to. In fact, God came and said, Jacob, you need to go home. You need to go back to the land of your fathers, which for Jacob meant facing his brother Esau. And as he was going, one of Jacob's scouts came back and said, Esau is already coming toward you, and he has a small army of 400 men with him. So for Jacob, this was his moment of reckoning. He's out of options. For those of us that can relate to Jacob and the constant struggle he had to get some kind of a blessing out of life, we can also relate to this moment of reckoning. I mean, for some people, life just seems to fall into place. It happens so easily. Things just work out, but not for us. For whatever reason, life has been much more of a struggle for us. But after running from place to place, after trying plan after plan after plan, and starting over more times than we can remember, we eventually, like Jacob, run out of options. There are no more degrees to get. No more medications or treatments to try. No more spouses to marry. No more addictive distractions we can use to try and, and numb our loneliness. It's just us. In that moment, we are alone. And all the, the guilt and the mistakes and the hurt from our past are rushing toward us like a small army. And all we can do is face up. That's where Jacob is in this text today. After sending all of his possessions and all of his family across the river at night, by the way, which is dangerous to do, he's desperate at this point, the text says that Jacob was left alone. No more plans, no more schemes, no more wealth. It's just him. And when it was just him, when he was alone, a man, out of nowhere, wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And you can imagine Jacob in this this fight, this wrestling match, with all of his past frustration and anger and disappointment suddenly just coming to a head and bursting out as he engages in battle with this man through the entire night. I mean, this is literally the fight of his whole life. And when the sun came up, Jacob would discover that his struggle had not just been with his brother Esau or his father-in-law Laban. His struggle had not just been with this mysterious man on the riverbank. His real struggle, the fight of his life, had really been with God. And Jacob could steal a blessing from other people. He'd gotten good at it, but he, he could never manage to steal a blessing from God. And that's what made him angry. I think. And it makes us angry too, because like Jacob, we believe in the promise. We believe the promises of Scripture that God has a plan for my life. A plan not to harm me, but to prosper me. We read that in Jeremiah. We believe that God uses all things that work together for the good of those who love Him. We read these promises in Scripture, but at some point, it comes out and we say, then why has so much of my life been so much of a struggle? If those blessings are true, why has it been so hard? And maybe, maybe for some of us it hasn't been that bad, but we know people for whom it has. There are people all around the world who have a daily struggle just to eat, just to feed their kids, just to survive the violence that's going on around them. What about them? These blessings are true. If God wants to bless us, then why is it so much of a struggle? And that's the question. That's that core question that's inside of us. But we can go years with ever, without ever facing up to it, without having the courage to actually ask that question. We can go decades sort of pretending that we can be satisfied with the petty little blessing that we can squeeze out of life for ourselves, completely unaware that our real craving is for this blessing from God. And so at some point, all that frustration, that disappointment, that anger, that confusion, it comes pouring out. And it's in that moment that we realize that the core issue has really been about our struggle with God. <coughs> I wonder if you have made that discovery. That your real struggle all along has been with God. 
that at the root of every other struggle you face, the struggle to get a paycheck, your struggle in, in work, your struggle in love, whatever other struggle that you can face in your life, at the root of all of those is your struggle with God. You get a blessing from God. Because none of those other struggles, none of those other difficult situations in life will ever be fully resolved until you face that struggle with God, until you finally have it out with God. And we can't have it out with God until God can get us alone. It's only when we are alone with God that the wrestling match really begins. Austin Phelps wrote in his book entitled The Still Here that no large growth in holiness was ever gained by one who did not take time to be often long alone with God. That's why solitude is such an important spiritual discipline, such a neglected spiritual discipline for Christians. Because in solitude, when we are alone, when God has us to himself, that's when we are forced to face that real issue and that real question, our struggle with God. And it's also when God has the chance to finally show us what receiving a blessing is really all about. One of the most interesting parts of this story is the fact that Jacob was winning the fight. He thinks it's against a man, but it's really against God, and God did not prevail against Jacob. That's because this was not just a fight. This was not just a wrestling match. God was not competing with Jacob to see who was stronger, to see who would win in a fight. God wanted to grab hold of Jacob, not to beat him, but to bless him. But notice what the blessing is. Jacob still thinks a blessing is something that gives him an advantage over other people. And so he does what he always did. He tries to steal a blessing from someone else. He clings to this guy and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. So the man asks, what is your name? And Jacob replies, my name is Jacob, which is really just another way of saying I'm a cheater. <laughs> In response to that, the man says to Jacob, No. Your name is not Jacob. You are not a cheater. That is not who you are anymore. From now on, your name will be Israel, because you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. That's what Israel means. It means he who strives with God. And at that moment, Jacob knew who he was really fighting. That night. That's why he named the place Peniel which means face of God, because as he says, he had seen God face to face. And that is the blessing, to see God face to face. All of his life, Jacob had been after a blessing from God, not realizing that the blessing is God. God is the blessing. And it's not a blessing that Jacob could steal for himself. He couldn't take it, he couldn't cheat it, he couldn't do it by himself. Seeing God face to face is a blessing that God wanted to give Jacob all along. God is not out to beat you. Even in the midst of your hardest struggles, God is not out to beat you. He is out to bless you. But the blessing that God has in mind is so much more than just a temporary fix to the struggles you have in life, your struggles with work and family or whatever else it might be. The blessing that God wants to give you, and he won't settle for anything less, is himself. When you cling to God like Jacob did, God is exactly what you get. That won't be an easy encounter. In fact, your struggle with God could be the hardest struggle you ever had. But at the end of it, you will discover that you have been in God's embrace the whole time. This does not mean that you will come away unscathed. During the fight, you heard the part of the story where God touched Jacob's hip socket and threw his hip out of joint so that he had a limp for the rest of his life. Jacob, who was good at running away, 
physically could no longer run. God took away the one thing Jacob was good at depending on himself for. Wrestling with God is not the safest thing you can do. In fact, there's a high likelihood that you'll come out of that encounter having lost something with, with a limp that takes away something that you thought you could depend on for yourself, but that was really just keeping you from depending on God. There's a good chance God will take that away from you. But the limp is actually an act of mercy on God's part because it, it, it's what keeps us coming back to God, depending on God, whose strength is made perfect in our weakness. After God had revealed his identity to Jacob, Jacob asked for his name. He just wanted to make sure who this really was. And God replied, why is it that you asked my name? <clears throat> Sometimes we look back over the struggles that we have faced or that look at the struggle that we might be facing now, and we want to ask the same question. Who, who is this? God, are you in this fight with me? Is this you? Are you present with me in this struggle? His answer is, do you even have to ask? Do you really even have to ask? The answer, of course, is yes. So when you find yourself asking, was God with me in my struggle against cancer? Or was God with me in my struggle through divorce? Or is God with me now even though I'm getting older and I feel less and less useful? The answer is always a resounding Yes. Do we even really have to ask? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.